Will y'all please help me welcome Frank Delaney reading Venetia Kelly's Traveling Show. Frank Delaney. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Delaney, and thank you for inviting me here. When I saw the invitation, Chutney Masala, I thought, well, at least I'd get some of that. And you had me at Chutney. <laughs> Before I read to you from Venetia Kelly's Traveling Show, I want to tell you something very important and something that you do not know, and something really interesting and part of all our heritage who are in this room tonight. Sitting among you is somebody who lives nearby who has done something very powerful and very remarkable, and you will see it this summer. She has made a documentary for the 50th anniversary of the publication of Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. I have seen the documentary, and I've seen the trailer, and I can't see the trailer without bursting into tears. It is as fine a television documentary as I have ever seen in my life, and that is my background. I spent years making documentaries for the BBC in London, presumed to be the best broadcasters in the world. This is a wonderful piece of work. It's got Oprah Winfrey in it, it's got Tom Brokaw in it, it's got all kinds of marvelous people, but what it really has in it is the heart of the best America you know. Her name is Mary Murphy, and she's down there. Oh. Now, I've written a book called Venetia Kelly's Traveling Show. It's the latest in a series of novels that tells the history of Ireland in the 20th century, because I'm trying to explain to myself how this island of 33,000 square miles, I almost said square feet, very little difference, <laughs> has managed to daub such a wide green stripe across the planet, but it has, and I don't quite know why. So I'm investigating it in the most truthful form I know, which is novel writing. And therefore, everything in this book is true, even though I made it all up. And that's as Irish as you can get. In every book that I write, I make the assumption that I am only 50% of the equation. The reader is the other half. My imagination is at work here, but damn it, it becomes your turn sooner or later. So at the beginning of every book I write, I do a little author's note, which is my valediction. I'm standing on the dock side, I'm launching my book out into the world, and it then become, becomes your book. But before I do that, I want a final handshake with you. And the handshake takes the form of a little author's note. Here's the author's note for Venetia Kelly's traveling show, because it's also the text of the sermon, so to speak. During the early 20th century, Ireland began to practice a wonderful new dramatic form, politics. It was free, compelling, and wild, and the Irish, with their fondness for high intrigue and low comedy, embraced it with love. This was a natural fit. Though colonized for generations and denied formal education, the Irish had retained in their race memory the innate culture of the oral tradition. Thus, they were always prepared to come out for someone who would tell a good story, play a fine tune, or act a great part. Extraordinary passions were stoked in this theater for all as massive figures of uneven character and temperament opened up the nation's soul. The country became notorious for fiercely fought elections, fevered by noble intentions, instabilities, and greed. Some of the candidates believed that they had a destiny to lead. Some proffered vision. Some scarcely bothered to hide their predatory intent. Idealism being the virginity of politics, the new nation burst at the seams with young zeal. But even the most idealistic discovered to their sorrow that freedom can also do harm to our values because democracy, our least worst system, takes away even as it gives. Innocence is the price of power. The Irish writer James Joyce had a wonderful thesis, very simple. He believed that in the particular is contained the universal. In each and every one of us is contained the story of humankind. Likewise, we may be in 1932 rural Ireland, in my home territory, and the house in this book, the farmhouse in this book, still stands two miles from where I lived as a child. But we are in any country in the world that is an emerging nation governing itself. 
The show, Venetia Kelly's Travelling Show, is a travelling kind of vaudeville of the kind I saw growing up, where there was a little bit of everything, a little bit of Shakespeare, a little bit of fire eating, a little bit of acrobatics. It was theatre, Jim, but not as we know it. They, these shows came to our village. We had no radio, we had no television. They were entrancing. And as a boy of nine, I got on my bicycle and I followed them from village to village within a 30 mile radius. The narrator of this book is a young man called Ben McCarthy. He's 18. He's got red hair. He's six foot four. He's handsome as all get out. He's an only child. And one day, his father takes him to see one of these traveling shows in which the actress, Venetia Kelly, who is at the center of this book, is the star. The opening line of the book is, she sprang from the womb and waved to the crowd. <laughs> then she smiled and took a bow. Here's what happens when Ben and his father go to the town of Cashel, which is four and a half miles from where I grew up. We reached the hall in Cashel an hour before the performance my father had insisted. With, with nobody else there, we sat side by side in the empty, freezing place. I should have known, but then hindsight is despicable. It mainly tells us how stupid we've been. Father chattered like a monkey that night. I had rarely seen him so animated. His face had reddened slightly as it did when we had company, for he'd had a few swift whiskies. And he did this anxious thing with his hands, tenting and interlacing his fingers back and forth, over and over. He also shifted in his seat like a man with bad hemorrhoids. I think we went in early because he'd hoped that we'd see some of the performers setting up the show. We didn't, but we heard them. Behind the crooked hangings that passed for a stage curtain, they shuffled and shoved, laughing and sending out little hollers to one another. At each sound, my father put his hand to his ear like a hunter and said, Whish, even if I hadn't been speaking. From time to time, he sat forward and cast to the back of the seat in front of him. Time stays infamously slow in the countryside. The poster outside said, eight o'clock, sharp. But not until a quarter past did people drift in. By half past eight, the hall had filled, but untidily so. Men stood at the back and chatted, banter, rattled back and forth. People left their seats to greet newcomers or to surprise a neighbor whom they had just seen three rows ahead and so on. My father grew ever more impatient. At 20 minutes before nine, an imperfect drum roll came from behind the curtains. It started hard and high and stayed that way until the audience quieted. And then a man pranced out, a tall man, naked to the waist, thin as an orphan, torso white as a sick fish. He wore the skin-tight pants of a troubadour, wide red and yellow stripes, and he turned two somersaults in the narrow space between the curtains and the edge of the stage. My father whispered to me, he's Michael, he's one of the leading actors. Michael turned two more somersaults, took a bow and disappeared behind the curtains. The drum roll began again. And a male voice called out, ladies and gentlemen, we present Miss Venetia Kelly in the famous Trial of Shylock by William Shakespeare. Part of the trick for this traveling company was to offer excerpts from plays in the school curriculum. This guaranteed attendance. Our teacher always said we missed a great deal by not seeing a performance of the play we were studying. That night, much of the audience consisted of boys and girls a little younger than me. In fact, the Merchant of Venice had formed part of my own English studies, and I knew the play by heart. The curtain drew open and revealed a row of chairs set up so that their backs formed a kind of hedge. This was evidently the front of the dock. On one chair knelt an elderly man facing the audience, clearly Antonio, because he looked so miserable. At the back of the stage on a high stool sat another old man wearing a black robe and a judge's long wing. He was the Duke. The acrobat Michael reappeared. He now wore a short black velvet jacket, but his height meant that a gap of his flesh appeared between the hem of the jacket and the waistband of his striped pants. I could tell that he was playing Bassanio because he walked up and down in a fret and he rubbed his hands together in an anguished way. Once or twice he gave us the benefit of a swift somersault. It had nothing to do with Shakespeare, but the audience loved it. <laughs> on a chair nearby, whetting an ugly knife on the sole of a shoe, sat Shylock, a small, extremely fat man with no neck. His front teeth reminded me of a rabbit's. Somewhere off stage, the drum rolled again. Michael, i.e. Bassanio, 
turned another swift somersault and got another cheer. As the drum roll stopped, everybody on stage stood up and stepped aside, making way. That was the moment when I first saw Venetia Cathy. Even now as I write it, all these years later, I need time to digest it. Let me tell you instead that my father had been disappearing throughout the year. He went at random intervals and in odd but always consistent ways. Mid-afternoon, he'd leave the fields or the yard or wherever he was working, go into the house, change into his best clothes and drive away. I often saw Mother frown as half hidden she watched from the porch or a window or behind a garden hedge. His return always woke me up. Sometimes he got back before midnight, sometimes an hour later, soon from far away. Came distant noises of argument in the suspended night. What had he been doing? I suddenly knew. He had been making journeys of different lengths to different towns to see these traveling pairs. As the evening wore on, I knew it more and more. He not only knew the name of every performer on the stage, he could remember their ad lib lines. I too began to mouth lines as he did. Antonio's the weakest kind of fruit drops earliest to the ground. They had taken some liberties with the text, and I soon understood why the piece had been rearranged to create an entrance for Portia. What is it about what we call today a star? What quality? What dimension? Is it an inner burn that transmits itself to us, whether he or she knows about it or not? Venetia Kelly made no dramatic stride into the center of the stage. She didn't leap or pounce. She kind of slouched on, a slow walk, shoulders taut, like somebody wondering whether to be wary. She looked all around the stage, taking in everything, and then came far enough downstage to be seen by the entire audience which at once felt, felt quiet. Beside me, my father reacted so hard that he made the bones of his chair creak. He pulled back his hands, tightened them into fists, and held them in front of him like a man containing himself. She wore, naked to foot, a black gown of a light velveteen material with a pattern like a faint Venetian brocade, and she wore small, pointed black velvet shoes, no jewelry, no ornament shot anywhere. From my father's throat came the noise of a small animal. I was barely able to take my eyes from this actress, and yet I had to look at him. Had I not known better, I should have said he was in pain. You could hear a feather drop in that shabby old hall. We weren't in casual. We were in old Venice. A step at a time, Portia looked to right, to left, her head turning like a lamp. Maybe I imagined it, but it seemed to me that each actor quickened when she looked at him, then stood or sat at greater attention. And still, as I tell you this, I marvel that she was as yet barely past 30 years old. And still I marvel as I feel again the pain of the memory that she was perfect. The first time I ever heard that voice, it was speaking a perfect rendition of Shakespeare's iambic meter, five notes to the bar, which is the merchant here, and which the Jew. Antonio and Shylock identified themselves to her. My father leaned forward and leaned back again, then he bent down, bent double almost, as today's aircraft passengers are instructed to do in a crash. He put his head in his hands. For a moment I thought that he'd been taken ill, and I tried to look at him. He had become inaccessible. No part of his face showed. I could see only his thick mane of bushy red hair. Are you all right? I whispered. He shook his head and came out of his dive, raising himself slowly. His eyes were still closed tight, and he bit so hard on his lip that I expected blood. He opened his eyes, turned them on me like lamps, and whispered these words, Ben, I'm not coming home with you tonight. Why? I whispered back. When we ask the most important questions, we already know the answer. How ill am I, doctor? Is my business ruined? Am I as inadequate as you think I am? Do you love me? Such was the case here. My father said, I'm going to join Venetia Kelly's traveling show. And by God, he does.
Now, as they say, read on. <laughs> and take questions if you have any. Who would like to ask a question? I hope that was what you expected to hear. Was... Yes. <laughs> yes, there's a lady over here. I listened to uh, two of your other books that you read. Yes. Yes, I did this in audiobook as well. It is sheer torture because I sit in the studio and I read it for consumption and all I can do as I'm reading it is note the number of errors I've made in the writing. <laughs> it is the, the, read, the, the text that I read of any book of mine in the studio for audiobook purposes is the longest suicide note I have ever come across. <laughs> Another question? Funny, I thought you'd all be asleep by now. There's someone in there. In the early days of actresses in Ireland, I know um, many of them had bad reputations of yes. being promiscuous. Was that the case when this was written as well? It was the case, well, actresses were largely thought of in the 19th century, certainly, and in the 18th and 19th century, they were largely thought of as hookers. There's a wonderful description of the Dean of St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin attending the first performance of The Messiah, Handel's Messiah, which is in Dublin. And when the actress, Mrs. Sibber, sings He Was Despised at one of the great areas in the auditorio, Dr. Delaney, no relation, the Dean of St. Patrick's Cathedral, jumps to his feet in the audience when she's finished and says, Madam, for this thy sins are forgiven thee. <laughs> There was this reputation, and it's such an astute question because the Venetia Kelly, the actress at the heart of the story, is exactly the opposite. Very briefly, the plot is Ben's father runs away with her. Ben's mother, Ben's an only child, they're well to do farmers. Ben's mother sends him off to bring the father back home. She says, bring your father back for me. The father has fallen in love with Venetia. Ben falls in love with Venetia. Wow. <laughs> so, but she's definitely, she's very virginal. She has a basis in very old legend. In old Irish legend, there is a poetic tradition going way back, I mean, to the time of before St. Patrick, it is traceable in oral history, but then written down in the fifth and sixth century, where a poet has a dream and in the dream comes to him a beautiful virginal woman. He represents his country or the spirit of his country or whatever. And I'm playing with that idea here. There's a lot of mythology in it. There sadly is very, very little promiscuity and no graphic sex. <laughs> I'm so sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> there was, of course, no sex in Ireland until television came, as one, as one politician did assert. There was never any sex, he said, in Ireland until television came here. My mother agreed with him, and I said to her, Mother, I am the eighth of your children. <laughs> And she said, yes, but we didn't know what was causing it. <laughs> I said, it's because, you, it's because your bed faces west. <laughs> there was a lady who had her hand up there. I feel like what going to be is nearly as much fun as this. Well, try me. <laughs> I was wondering if you had any answers to why a small country like Ireland has managed to paint a, a wider swath of you ask an Irish woman a question, you say, I wonder if you have any answers. Are you nuts? <laughs> you have answers for everything. There's a very serious answer. This is actually, in many ways, a very serious book. It tells you everything you need to know about Irish politics in this respect. We, vote, we, we invented, as you know, the slogan, vote early, vote often. But in this, Venetia Kelly is also a ventriloquist. And she has a dummy called Blarney. And that's the top of the bill. And in the great 1932 general election at the heart of this book, the election which changed all Irish politics for all time, she runs Brownie as a candidate in the election. That's all you need to know about Irish politics, especially as he damn near wins. The serious reason is this. We had the great, great gift of 800 years of oppression by England. So we had a permanent enemy. And we had the thing we love most, which is victimhood. In Ireland, they say, Alzheimer's disease sufferers forget everything except the grudge. <laughs> well, we have 800 years of grudge to work off. And in that grudge was the fact that we were not allowed to retain our own beautiful Gaelic language, which is lyrical and lovely. And it is rather useful because it has no single word for yes, no single word for no, and no single word for sex. And if you have a language that has no single word for any of those three terms, you can just get through anything in life. 
So the English language was supposed to pun us. So therefore, we took this language as a political measure and said, if they're going to make us speak their language, then we're going to use it in a much more interesting and inventive way than, than they did. Hence, we got James Joyce. Hence, we got Oscar Wilde and William Butler Yeats. And they were only the beginning. So in the language came the personality, a sense of daring, and a refusal to believe facts. And those are essential to the Irish nature. <laughs> Anything else? Another question? Yes. Um, how old is the uh, narrator when looking back on these books? How old is he? He's quite. He's. He hasn't divulged his age because he's also the subject of the book I'm just about to deliver, which is the second book in this series. This is going to be a trilogy. Ben's the narrator on the second one. The second one is called The Matchmaker of Ken Mayer. It's about a 25-year-old girl who has a gift for making marriages which takes her through World War II. Um, he's, you can assume that he's in his 70s, but he's writing in the persona, or trying to write in the persona of a boy of 18, recapturing his own innocence. He has, by then, developed a very interesting career in that he becomes a folklore collector for the wonderful Irish Folklore Commission, and he goes around the country gathering old legends, mythologies, and songs. And Ben continues in that tradition in the next novel and the next novel after that. But the point of taking somebody back into constant hindsight, hindsight is it gives him the value of being able to judge what innocence actually is. The book is about innocence. It's about the boy growing up with the country. It's about the country's political spirit growing for the first time. And it's the boy losing his own innocence. And it's fundamentally also about greed. So it's about a lot of things. When James Joyce published Ulysses in Paris, Scott Fitzgerald happened to be in the city that day. And he came across Joyce sitting at a boulevard cafe table. And he dropped to his knees and says, Mr. Joyce, may I kiss the hand that wrote Ulysses? And Joyce, who was rather a haughty man, said, you may certainly not. It's done a lot of other things, too. <laughs> and this book does a lot of other things, too. <laughs> Another question? Uh, do you want me to take another question? Please. Okay. There's nobody from the wings telling me to shut up. Good. Yes. Can you say something about starting off with the Sarah, the mother character, the way you did? Have you already read this book? Don't tell me the ending. I'm not. Uh, okay. Uh, spoiler warning. Um, actors and actresses interest me. My heart may be in novels, but my soul is in the theatre, I think. Because you are speaking a story with everything you have. And you never know quite which is the real person and which is the actor, because they don't. And I needed an emblematic figure who seems to be wonderful, but who is completely untrustworthy on every single level, but yet is marvelous at what she does. And I also wanted to explore to some degree a mother-daughter relationship that depends from jealousy. It depends from jealousy the way a light depends from the ceiling. And the daughter is actually a better actress than the mother. So how will this play out when the mother sees Ben and just looks at him and thinks, Adonis, this is the most beautiful young man I've ever seen. He, by the way, is completely unaware of this. So I take the figure of a woman who is in her 50s, who has used all her skills and gifts to preserve all her looks, who is not above turning around and posing to Ben and showing him how wonderful, wonderful a figure she has even in her 60s, as the book goes on. And I wanted to see whether he, as a young man, can grow to see what acting is and what real life is. And she's the emblem of that. So what the kind of books I write seem to be very, very, very simple on the surface. And they contain a story that is told on the surface. But rather like a duck, they seem calm, calm on top, but my God, it's working furiously underneath. That's the whole idea. And as you dig into the character of Sarah, the mother, you'll see how the character kind of unravels, but never fully does. Anybody else? No, I've struck you all down. Now, now we've all been up here this evening working. It's your turn now. I want you to do something. Tomorrow is St. Patrick's Day. So you will all join me in one verse of one, two, three, four. When Irish eyes are smiling, come on. Sure it's like a morning spring, come on. In the little time of Irish laughter, you can hear the angels sing. 
Voilà. 